And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery. <coughs> the open bar of the internet. Sorry, I had some. I think it's well to fly or something. The world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Lion Wing Publishing, whose previous endeavors include the translation of Gun and Gun and Embryo Machine, now stepping into the realm of um, Table Talk RPGs, which we'll get into in a minute, in the form of Picaresque Roman, a Requiem for Rogues, the one and only Bradley Hailstorm. How you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred, I am good. Uh, doing very well. Excited to talk about um, Picaresque Roman and whatever else comes up in conversation. So, I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games as a whole and what made it stick for you. Yeah, sure. So, I actually got to the scene a little bit late on uh, TRPGs. So I was, I was mostly a video gamer growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, started incorporating more traditional like board games, card games into my hobby time as I got into like my, my late teens. Took a break from the medium entirely once I got to college and really just focused on um, video games because it was easier, it was more accessible, whatever. Um, didn't have the time to dedicate to getting together a group and playing something over the tabletop. And then I, so I, I graduated college, uh, decided to go back to get my master's. And uh, like any good master's student, I actually studied less in my master's program than I studied in my bachelor's program. Um, did less homework, did less prep in my master's than I did for my bachelor's. And because then I had somehow more time on my hands, I decided, you know what? Um, I want to kind of get back into tabletop games a little bit mm -hmm. at the time uh i, I kind of got back into it with with magic and uh and that was fun uh, but i was living with a guy at the time my roommate mike who had played a lot of earlier versions of D D, and he was like dude you know like this is fun playing magic but have you ever played a like a an rpg and i'm like i have casually thought about it uh, but I've I've never really given it much thought. And he was like, dude, why, why don't we like get get some of our friends together? We'll we'll play some D D. Like, I remember enough to like GM us. We'll be fine. Um, at the time, it was D D fourth edition. So I get to tell people that f that four E got me into tabletop RPGs. Now, some people will be like, oh yeah, right on. That was really great. That was, that was a great addition. I think most people would be like, that's a terrible addition. Why'd you learn on that system? Uh, but that is the system that was available available to me at the time and we it worked for grog. me you know we not do... having sorry we do not grog here in the temple if if for if for you was your start it's like hey it hey if it works it works it, and and you know man it worked for me uh not having really any experience i actually found the system to be really welcoming which you know now that i look back on it i've got a lot more years under my belt i'm like yeah no actually i think they accomplished what they set out to with fourth edition because folks like me had never played an RPG before and it was a great first entry into the genre. Mm -hmm. So I started with fourth uh, and just absolutely loved it and then kind of like went down the rabbit hole uh, but really kind of settled on Shadowrun. So Shadowrun's my thing. Mm -hmm. um, still to this day, Shadowrun's my thing. And uh, I've, I've pretty much been in the in love with the medium ever since. I've, I have my own streaming show for Lion Wing on Wednesdays and I will often say to folks on that stream that uh, RPGs are my preferred tabletop genre of choice. Mm -hmm. All day, every day, twice on Sunday, I will choose to play an RPG. So something really clicked with me 12 years ago, um, or whenever that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, actually. Uh, and, and I've been with it ever since. So kind of a, a late bloomer, uh, but I'm glad I, I eventually got to the table, so to speak, because uh, it really just put its hooks in me and hasn't let me go since. Well, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, better late than never. Um, right, me too. Now, <clears throat> with that with with that in mind, the ne um, since you brought up Shadowrun, I'll a I'll ask you this, um, and this is gonna be my this is gonna be my dumb question, my first dumb question for the night. How many pounds of D6s do you have? Oh man, too many. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, 
That's my stock answer. Too many. Lies. I, you can I, never so have I, too I, many. No, it's true. It's true. You can never have too many. You can have never, never have too many dice. You can never never have too many neoprene play mats. So those are the two things that I hoard um, to sort of like gross excess. And I, I say that somewhat shamefully, though I'm less ashamed of my dice than I am of my my play mat collection. So I couldn't tell you how many how much poundage I have in dice. I'll just say that it's probably as much as my my youngest uh, child weighs. Yeah. So now the main thing that the main thing that I know um, Lion Wing Publishing for is is their is their um, localization of. Um, of Japanese tabletop games. Um, my first introduction to that to your uh, output was through was through Embryo Machine, and then later on through um, Gun and Gun. Um, <clears throat> and what I something that and now with now with um, Picaresque Roman, which is going to be your first um, role playing adjacent affair. How much experience did you have previously when it came to Japanese um, role playing games? So quite a bit. So I have a I have a bit of an affinity mm -hmm. for collecting uh, Japanese RPGs. Mm -hmm. I prefer to collect older, long since out of print Japanese RPGs. Uh, '90s Japanese RPGs are my favorite things to collect currently, um, even more so than probably dice and uh, play mats at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to recant my previous statement to say that those are my only two things that I hoard in excess. Because now I'm getting to a point where I probably could officially say that I'm hoarding Japanese table talk RPGs in excess. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, my, my love for Japanese table talk RPGs goes back quite a ways as well. Not as far back as when I started playing 4E, obviously. Um, well, maybe not obviously, but still, it doesn't go back that far. Uh, I, I started working in localization in the video game sector mm -hmm. uh, to some degree about a, about a decade ago. And when you get into... And I was... I was was in like Japanese games localization, so a lot of Japanese visual novels, RPGs, MMOs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at that time, as I was getting more familiar with localization and whatnot, and as I was beginning to really get acclimated more to uh, a variety of Japanese media, you know, I kind of stumbled upon Japanese RPGs. Now, at this time, I wasn't I uh, wasn't playing a lot of uh, RPGs in general because although the, the genre got its hooks in me. And never let me go there were times where there was like an ebb and a flow in my life where i played more and then i played less depending on what was happening around me mm -hmm. and so i got into the localization scene as a, as a profession um and there was a lot of stuff happening in my life so i didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of like hobby stuff um but i was discovering japanese table talk rpgs while this was going on even though i wasn't playing a whole lot i was like dude i love this stuff like i, I want to learn more about what the japanese rpg scene is like and so i just started buying books um i i buy them wherever i could find them uh time amazon japan was not really an option which now it is you know you can pretty much order anything from amazon japan that's fine but at that time it was a lot trickier to to come, aco come across uh, Japanese uh, RPGs. So I spent a lot of time on eBay and, and Japanese Yahoo auction sites uh, <laughs> just trying to amass my collection and to see like this whole, this whole uh, arena, uh, this whole like thing that I had missed my entire life and I was trying to play catch up. And what was really cool and what is really cool about the Japanese uh, RPG scene is they do a lot of like licensed games, especially during the '90s, was a huge yeah. thing. So there's like an Evangelion game, or Evangelion game. There's a, I think there's um, two of them. There's a Lunar. Yeah, no, I mean there's 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 so many just anime licensed RPGs um, that use the Mages system and everything. So I mean that was kind of like the the one system where, where they just adapted everything that they could find uh, to an RPG to some degree. And so I just started buying up books off of properties that I knew. And that's kind of how I got started in it. And then once I formed Lion Wing, um, you know, we started off with, with a card game and then have up until just this past month, uh, um, we were in that card game board game space when it came to localization projects. However, our foray into RPGs, although to the public, just started last month. We've been working. We had been working on Picross Roman since 2019. So, um, so it was really interesting because like people started knowing us as like this this Japanese board game localization studio, mm -hmm. 
on the backside, though, I know all the other projects that are in the queue and that are being worked on. And I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be really interesting when everyone thinks that we're like this card and board game company and we're going to drop this RPG on people. And then we did. And a lot of people were like, I didn't <laughs> I didn't ex- I did not see that coming, you know, because like um, uh, an indie Japanese RPG is about as niche a product as you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. um in this industry and so uh i think it surprised people like oh you went from gun and gun and embryo machine testament wild hunt festival and now an rpg okay um and and you know what people showed up though people were receptive to the idea i had no idea if there was going to be an audience for it and there was um well i remember i i remember when um i remember when i remember when fireborn came out from fantasy flight games and there were a bunch there were a bunch of people um, tilting their head about about that project, go, going, "What the what the hell is this? What the hell is this? Why are they doing? Why are they doing an? Why is Fantasy Flight Games doing an RPG company? They're mostly a board. They're mostly board and card game people. So, there's a precedent for that kind of um, pleasant surprise. Um, for sure. Yeah, I, I I say all the time that I, I don't know if this is good business practice or not, but it is my business practice that I just love localize the games that I want to play. Mm-hmm. Like um I'll, I I will do a little bit of market research about, you know, what what are what, what are the trends right now? Like I don't want to localize a game that's just going to be dead in the water. And at the same time, um uh a lot of the stuff I'm like, "Oh, you know, I've got a huge audience for this. I'm not sure I care a whole lot uh cuz I want to play it. Uh and if I want to play it, there's a good chance that I'm going to localize it." Mm-hmm. And that was the case with with Picross Grom and especially in 2019, there were even less Japanese RPGs that had really been uh, shown off to the West, to the English market. You know, we had we had a couple at that time, and I think they all came from Kodadami Heavy Industries, and some, um, you know, some, so I, and a, I, some and a few other and a couple a couple other instances, but um, it yeah, really like was made and whatnot. Niche. Yeah, for sure, and it, and it still is though. It's it's gotten a little less niche, um, and by like it's gotten a little less niche i mean by like a quarter of a percent it's gotten less niche um it's still very niche but it was uh it was one of those things where i was like i don't know if there's an audience for this but like i want to play this game this game is fun Mm -hmm. uh it's 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 super striking to look at it's got some really unique mechanics um so that's when i introduced it to my team and we played it and everyone was like dude this is a killer game you should do something with this and i was like hey that's funny because i actually i actually already signed the contract so um we have to do something with it now Mm mm-hmm and um, glad you if you don't glad you like it if you don't mind i'd like to play a little bit of a lightning round when it comes to other um other ja- other japanese tape tabletop games to um tabletop rpg specifically to see if you're familiar with it if you've ru- if you've run it and just ju- and just other um thoughts that come to mind sure um so i'll start i'll start i'll start with the fir- i'll start with the first one that ever came that ever came out um made yes uh good system fun system um slice of life fun um pioneered paved the way mm-hmm. for everything that came after it all right tenra uh yeah uh kodadama's first i believe uh publication of a japanese trpg mm-hmm. not, not not my favorite of of the ones that they have produced um Double Cross. Oh, of course. I mean, Double Cross, Night Wizard, Sword, Sword World. I mean, you know, th- those are sort of like the staples in, mm-hmm. in the TRPG scene. Double Cross is my least favorite of the trio. Mm-hmm. Um, Ryutama. Oh, of course. Uh, I, I can I call Ryutama Grandia the tabletop RPG. Um, my favorite Kododama works. Uh, one of my favorite to take it out of the localization sector for a moment. One of my favorite Japanese TRPGs, just in general. Mm-hmm. Um, Shinobi Gami. Good game. Uh, killer art. Really cool systems. Lots of Dojin support when it comes to uh, Dojin replays and supplements. Mm-hmm. I hope that we see some official supplements come out for the English market. I really like Shinobi Gami. Yeah, and uh, um, well, you you already meant you already mentioned this, so I'll bring it up. Um, Sword World Two. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I like two point five more. I um I have I haven't I've only delved into a half ass translation of um two of of um half ass fans translation of two. I can't really comment on two point five. Um. Um. Kagami, or not, <laughs> not Kagami. The um, um, the, um, God Hunters. Uh Kamigakari. Kamigakari. I don't know why. Yeah. I said um. Know. Yeah. So I actually have not played Kamigakari. Um. I ha- I ha- I have mostly because of how long I ended up waiting for it. But then again, I waited two years for Anima, so I can. So I'm a pa- I'm an extremely patient man. Um. Since you brought it, since you brought it up, also, um, Night Wizards. Uh, I like I like Night Wizard a whole lot, mm-hmm. a whole lot. I think uh, I think two E is better than three. Uh, I don't know if people really cared much for what they did with three. I think that shows in sales, and um, I hope that they write the ship for the next edition. It's been a while now. Since uh, since Night Wizard three E came out several years at this point, I'm curious to see when they go back to that well because I think they will. It's it's too big a name to let three be its legacy. So I think they'll try to write the ship, and I hope they do. Yeah. Um. As much as much as this has become a meme, um, Dark Souls. Since you brought since you brought up licensed IP ones, I figured I'd throw, throw at least one of them in there. Uh, the 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 Katakawa published a Dark Souls yes. TRPG. Oh no, um, <laughs> that one's not so good. That's not so good. I um I don't I'd only heard I'd only heard mixed things on, mixed um things on it from the people that I had asked. Um, and truth and truth be told, I'm not entirely sure if I'd use a D6 system for for um emulating Dark Souls. I'd Honestly, I'd probably use Rollmaster if it, uh, if anything. Oh, but that's but that's just me. Um, I think uh, I think mixed is being very generous to that game. Call, what I'm what I'm saying is calling that the it, response is, mixed is that um <laughs> there is that there are some people there are some people I met who defended the thing as not as not as bad, and some people who did not care for it. Um. I am I am of the opinion that um adapting dark adapting dark souls into an RPG is going to be a very tr- a very a very difficult affair simply because of how solitary of a video game dark souls is. Um yeah, I mean that's 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 one of my issues with the dark souls RPG. It it it, it didn't need to exist necessarily. And yeah, I'm not sure it translated super well to an RPG. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and I'm, but you know, let's set that aside and let's say, all right, well, it, they're making it. Okay, I don't know if I agree with the premise, but okay, whatever. Um, let's give it a shot. It feels like a missed opportunity with what was presented. I wouldn't. I mean, it's not like this horrible game. It's not like an abomination of a game. No, like, there's, if, there's if, far worse offenders that I can bring up. Oh my! Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> there are way, way, way worse. Way I am. Worse. I am uh, probably one of the few people who's ever, who's had who's tried to read through the unholy the unholy quartet of bad RPGs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 I, it is certainly not at the bottom of the list. It's not even near the bottom of the list, but it just felt like such a missed opportunity that the uh, disappointment that was its mediocrity felt all the more crushing because you know what could have been uh, and that's even considering the fact that the premise doesn't really lend itself well to the to the genre but um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I wish I would have done more with it and yeah, I agree, a D6 system was an interesting decision. I, I say that but I remember that um the dice, the fan-made Dice Souls project had a had a dice pool system um, to represent stamina, and it, it it at the very least was do, was doing something with it, um, because you, because instead instead of ha- instead of having set um, stamina drain, you had to you had to pick how much stamina you were putting into an action, 
So you had to be and so you had to be careful as far as how, as far as how much effort you were do, you were doing. I think that sounds sounds interesting. Yeah. Um well, since you since you mentioned Shadowrun, I'm curious if you if you've at all delved into some of the er, some of the early um the early Katakawa attempts to bring Shadowrun in, into Japan. Yes, yeah, so um, specifically Shadowrun um, and Earth Dawn, I should clarify. So I like uh so group S and E handled a lot of the um English to Japanese translation mm-hmm. for the Japanese release of Shadowrun. And it's pretty much been with the franchise uh for a while. Yeah. And and Group Group S and E is that company. It's like in Group S and E I trust. I really just I I love Group S and E's works. Mm-hmm. Um However, I have I am not super well versed in Japanese Shadowrun outside of an obscure uh partnership for the Sega CD or the Mega CD where Group S and E partnered up with Compile Heart to produce what I think is the best Shadowrun video game out there, and that is indeed Shadowrun for the Mega uh, the Mega CD. I'd say, the, I'd say the harebrained games I'll, come close as a close second. I, don't get yeah no I agree I mean um, Dragonfall is is top notch even just Shadowrun Returns Vanilla is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't I, I liked I liked Hong Kong as well quite a bit, but I I felt like uh, Dragonfall was amazing, and still I think that Sega CD version uh, was just a masterclass in storytelling and gameplay. Uh, I. I love that game. Uh, Supposedly, that was the last. That being game said, I don't have a lot of experience. Um, I do remember. I do remember coming across some articles um, del- delving into it. The early, um, the early attempt from Group S N E um, was vastly was vastly different in tone um, when it came to how Shadowrun is treat how, Sh- how Japan is treated in Shadowrun in um, canon versus the canon that they ended up creating. Um, which ended up spawning a couple manga that I've seen stills of, but I haven't read. I don't. I don't even think they ever got official translations. Um, and Earth Dawn, which is which is which is important because both of them at the time were FASA properties, and that's who Group S and E was working with. Um, Earth Dawn, I, f- I find I find the Japanese version of that far more interesting. Large. In in some degree, due to who they due to who they got to handle um, hand, handle art. Um, the his name his name currently escapes me, but he's mostly known as being the guy to to do um who did um character and monster design for a lot of um, tokusatsu in the eighties throughout the nineties, and to a de- to a degree the early two thousands. Um, and they man- they managed to get- they managed to get him they managed to get him on and he's his work his work is very is very well renowned. Um, so that was that was quite a get- that was quite a get and the what they did with it was was pretty damn good. Um, of course I have to get I've this is a this is a bit of a um this is a bit of a, a bit of a reach when it comes to this kind of lightning round but um did you ever look into the Japanese version of the um, old rules cyclopedia. Negative. Um, <laughs> it was um, it was it 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 was interesting. Putting aside the fact that they um they ended up doing whole new art, which I used when I back in the day when I when I um was on a crusade to kill off the JRPG versus WRPG argument around the ta- around that time, um. But oh, but also, they split the book into three, and the and the page size was the um, the same that same page size that you would that you would see for a volume of a manga, which just boggles my mind how how anybody was able to get that to work with that size because the rules cyclopedia even in A4 size is big. And you're you're splitting that into three and ha- and having it have the same page size as a um well individual pages I should say as a um as a manga volume. 
I don't remember. I don't remember the um, code. The code of the thing. But getting past the lightning round, um, how did you first find out about picaresque Roman? Yeah. So before before picaresque Roman, there was another uh, TRPG that we were working on acquiring the. Um, the English rights to. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to reveal what that is because recently, um, oh, let me go back. We we're okay. So we were working on acquiring the English rights to this other TRPG. Things fell through. Mm -hmm. They pointed us in the direction of uh, Group SGR as sort of like a, sorry, this didn't work out. Maybe you could talk to these guys. Uh, and I was like, oh, you know, okay, interesting. I. Hadn't heard of Group SGR at the time, so I looked at their stuff. Said, "Hey, this this looks really this looks really cool." At that time, however, they didn't have a whole lot under their belt. So you know, now they've got about ten books across a variety of properties that they've uh, that they've written, that they've published and produced. But this was uh, this was 2018. We started uh, we started localization development in 2019 on Picaresque Roman, but this was 2018, mm -hmm. and they only really had Picaresque Roman uh, under their belt. They had a they had a um, like an unofficial supplement to something I can't recall what it was, but so their their catalog was very small. So I'm like, okay, you know, this is this is a super small uh, Dogen circle, which I love supporting. So like already, I'm like, all right, you know, thanks for the handoff, thanks for the referral to these guys. This seems really interesting. I, uh, I ordered the book because I, I, even though this other company was like, "Hey, you should check out these guys. They're they're really awesome. Um, Picard's Roman's really cool. You should give that one a look specifically." I'm like, "Okay, you know, just because you said it was great, <laughs> you know, I gotta I gotta check it out myself." So I ordered the book. Um, I don't want to say immediately fell in love with it uh, because that sounds like hyperbole, but it was about as immediate as you can get. Uh, where I went through the book and I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is this is the one. Um, I, I'm reaching out to Group SGR uh, tomorrow, and in fact, that's what I did. With it being our first venture into the genre, I knew we needed to we needed to make some kind of splash. Uh, it couldn't just be like any RPG that we were picking up. This had to be special, mm -hmm. and although it wasn't our first choice. I'm glad that things didn't work out with the first game so that Picaresque could be our first choice, uh, or at least uh, the, the first RPG that, that was under the Lion Wing banner, uh, because it was the right game for us. It, it sort of encapsulates everything that I look for in a game. It, encapsulate every, it cap encapsulates everything that Lion Wing sort of stands for in games. Um, interesting mechanics, beautiful art, all of that. And so it was just kind of dumb luck that this other contract fell through and that team was cool enough to say hey check out these guys and now what's funny is we're now working with that that first team where the contract fell through to bring that game uh check fell through uh we're bringing that out uh in english so it it's a f life has a funny way of working itself out mm -hmm. now with that with that kind of thing in mind when you uh, when when it was brought to you what was what would you say were some of the things that stood out to you that that made that made you say, okay, we need to do picaresque? Sure, it was two things. In fact, it was the game's inspirations and how it capitalized on those inspirations mm -hmm. to pay homage to them, but also find its own identity. So the game is very much so a Yakuza cross Persona Five type game. Mm -hmm. To uh, so I love Yakuza. I love Persona. Those are great series. Mm -hmm. So immediately, I'm like, okay, I'm into this because I like those games. And then, then I see how it, you know, some games are, just, they lean too heavily into their inspirations. And it's like, eh, this kind of just feels like a derivative work, and I'm not really into that. But this was like, okay, yeah, no, I can definitely feel like the, the inspirations in the game's tone. And the and even in the game's aesthetic, and even in some of its mechanics, but like this game is very much so doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. It's nodding to those games, um, but it's also saying like, uh, we're we're also picaresque Roman. We're not like the Yakuza game. We're not the we're not the Persona Five game. We are the picaresque Roman game, mm -hmm. and then and it might just happen to remind you of these other games that we like a lot too. And so that's what did it for me. Yeah. Um. Now I can I can definitely I can definitely see that and I'm, and. I, 
I um I will I will I will admit that um it was not a good idea for me to for me to read through the sample of um picaresque Roman while I was playing Picanimosa because <laughs> the two of them ended up blending in my head. And it certainly doesn't help that both of them are kind of leaning into that noir kind of storytelling. Uh, yep, yep. Um but when I when but when I looked at the when I looked at the way that it, the way that it was that it was set up, um, given given the given the set the setup of qualities and the gig and side gig, um, would it be fair to draw comparisons between this and the framework that's used in Powered by the Apocalypse? Prob uh, yeah, probably. I think that's. I think that's a fair comparison. Is it a perfect one? No, but if you've got to use something as a reference that other people will know who are not in the Japanese TRPGs, that's probably as as good as you're going to get. Yeah, and to be to be fair, this 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 kind of this kind of pr primary and secondary archetype thing is something I see fairly frequently in um in Japanese tabletop. I'd um I I'd, I'd say I, it's I'd probably blame Sword World for that kind of thing the most, because it because it had the whole A and B classes. Yeah, you know, I mean, picaresque Roman. So it does its own thing. Like it's mm -hmm. got its own unique approach to the genre, and at the same time, you can you can sense the DNA of some of the games that Group SGR and that Seagraceon really liked, mm -hmm. and Sword World is in there for sure. Yeah. Um and with with that with that kind of thing in mind, um something something I I'd, I'd like to I'd like to ask is in is in regard to the import to how much of a factor um main gigs and um side gigs um play. Is it is it a case where it, where your choice of gigs mainly determines the um pool of um skills that you're going to have? Or are there or are there um, other aspects that they that play a factor into those during character creation? Yeah, it'll be skills and stats. So for for the side gig, it's just skills. It's just the skill that you're gonna kind of feel the side gig impacting. But in terms of the main gig, yeah, that's where you've you're gonna feel it in the skills that are available to you, and also the stats that you're awarded based on that archetype. Mm -hmm. uh, now each each main gig has a, a whole litany of skills, but you can't take all of them. You can only take two skills for your main gig, uh, and then you take one skill from your side gig. So you got three three skills effectively, mm -hmm. um, and then and then five stats to to kind of play around with. Yeah. Now, obvious obviously going into the side gigs would be uh, would be kind would be kind of would be kind of redundant. But I'd like to, because of the fact that there are only five main gigs, I'd like to go over each of them and the general vibe about what they're going to be good at and what they and what they might struggle with. If you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Let me uh let me pull up my cheat sheet here. Um. So first, I'm just going from top to bottom on these, and the um first one is yakuza. Yeah. So yakuza uh, is all about all about violence. So as you, as you might suspect mm -hmm. um and even if you see kind of the the game's key uh the key art that's used for the yakuza uh main gig you would probably suspect that okay yeah this is a this is a a class that's going to lead into lean into that brute force mentality mm -hmm. now you can modify that approach you don't have to be a yakuza who's always violent but that's going to be ultimately decided by the skills that you take from the yakuza because they're not all like uh you know ag aggression related mm -hmm. uh, but it's also going to be affected by the the side gig that you choose because that stat when you've only got three stats you know, if you say like, oh, if I choose one skill from a side gig without context, it's like, oh, well, what kind of difference is that going to make one, you know, one skill? Uh, but when you realize you've only got three to take, one skill is, <laughs> you know, it has a pretty significant impact about how you're going to play that character. Mm -hmm. um, but still, that being said, you know, Yakuza is a, a great, uh, a great class choice if you're looking to just beat people down. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's not all that, but a lot of it a lot of it is that, and you can even see that like in its skill names. You've like these are just a couple: overwhelm, warrior, 
uh, steadfast, ready to rumble. You know, mm-hmm. at, you get that tone already of like, okay, this is the type of the type of character that this is going to be. And and he, it even says in the rule book that you know yakuza earn their living through violence and beholden to neither society nor law. So you, you kind of know right what you're going, you know, what you're going to get into right away with the Yakuza. So I always say to people, uh, if if you've never played an RPG before ever, and and you're using Picaresque Roman as as your first uh, venture into the genre, and it is a great way to kind of get into the genre. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to hawk a product. I actually believe that mm-hmm. um, it's very accessible. I will tell you that start with Yakuza. You know, do a Yakuza, and then you know we can talk about side gigs uh, to sort of dial in how you want to play that Yakuza. You know, that's where you get into the minutia mm-hmm. of how you want to conduct yourself as a Yakuza with that side gig. Um, but start with the Yakuza. I think it's the most beginner friendly, um, the beginner friendly main gig of the bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, next would be Info Broker. Yeah. So. Um, There are things in Picross Roman called gather info checks, and they play a significant role in the mechanics of the game. They play a significant role in how the game plays out. Info brokers are all about gathering, well, info, and then utilizing that info against other players, but also for yourself to be able to um, to be able to gain the trust of other players. So it, Picaresque Roman is is what we call a PvPVGM game, mm-hmm. and that means that um, sometimes you're cooperating with your fellow players. Oftentimes, you're fighting against them, and then all the time you're worrying about who the traitor is amongst the group because there is a traitor who's sort of working for the GM in the game. And so the info broker can really utilize info, uh, which is you know you know if you're get, if you're gathering info, which is one of the actions you can choose per round, you're able to form truce, you know alliances with other players, but then you're also able to use that info to break those truce or to put people into binds that they don't want to be in based on the info that you have on them. So uh, the info broker. I often consider as uh, I play a lot of magic. So the info broker is sort of like a blue deck. Um, you can really manipulate other people and their play style based on the skills that you choose. Again, just like the Yakuza, you don't have to play an info broker exactly like that. There are eight or so skills, um, seven skills, I think. Uh, and not all of them will play into that play style, but a good majority of them do. And so it's, I think, one of the more challenging classes to play mm-hmm. and it doesn't have super super strong stats in all the areas you would maybe want your stats to be in so it takes more forethought than some of the other main gigs mm-hmm. now next would be um swindler yeah so um the swindler is the ultimate con person mm-hmm. i i love i love the swindler it is probably my my favorite main gig in the game um, because it excels in both charm and insight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the swindler, as you might suspect is charismatic, good talker can utilize those skills to their benefit. The confidence. man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, even one of the skills itself is called spitting lies. I mean, uh, uh, and then we've got false truce. We've got silver tongue, uh, crossed fingers. So this is all about uh, backstabbing people essentially Mm -hmm. and there's there's something really fun about that in picaresque roman especially and it capitalizes on that gameplay uh very well what's interesting is like okay so yakuza is a character that really excels only in violence in the violence stat info broker is a gig that really excels only in insight swindler diverts its attention into both charm and insight so although I think the Info Broker is actually a more challenging class to play, there is an element of complexity and not as much straightforwardness when you're building your character and then trying to capitalize on the stats that you have with the Swindler mm-hmm. because it is a bit of a winding road type class and not a straight shot. But it's a lot of fun because I think it gives you more freedom than some of the other classes to really play with the narrative and then to to, to parlay that narrative into cool um, kind of gameplay moments that make for fun, you know, f- fun scenarios at the table. Mm-hmm. 
Now, next one is um, Heartbreaker. Yeah, so <laughs> the Heartbreaker excels in charm. So we're going back to uh, a main gig that really excels just in one in one stat, mm -hmm. and that is charm. Um, and so a big part of Picaresque is building relationships with the other players. And then, of course, breaking those relationships. Uh, because this is, narratively speaking, the city, which is where Picaresque Roman takes place, which is this plan, this this place that is both uh, within and without of Japan. Mm -hmm. And so um, it plays by its own rules, and its rules are there are no rules, essentially. And so every Picare, every rogue in the city, ultimately is out for their own personal gain. Yeah, you're going to make truce and you're going to form relationships, but there's always going to be this underlying sense of, I'm doing this for my own personal gain, not to be nice to you. And the Heartbreaker really kind of plays into that more than the other classes. Uh, because as you might imagine from the name of the class, um, it's, real about, it's really about being able to form relationships, form them effectively, be able to utilize the benefits of being in a truce with someone, and then being able to break it without there being any, any penalty for being able to break that truce. And so that also creates a, that, that creates a cool dynamic that requires a different gameplay approach than the other gigs, and that's what I like about Picaresque Roman. And really, you know, when I say this, it's gonna sound no different than any other RPG, but it really does feel uh, especially true for Picaresque. All of the main gigs feel very, very, very different and require you to sort of like shift your way of thinking. Like, I can't approach the same way, I can't approach the game in the same way when playing a Heartbreaker as I would a Yakuza or an Info Broker or a Gambler or a Swindler. You really have to like stop and say, hold on a second, I've got to reconceptualize how I interact with this game to get the most out of this character. I mean, even, you know, I'm looking at the, the skill names right now for the for the Heartbreaker and, and I look at the last one, which is called Homewrecker. Um, and, and you can, you know, Homewrecker allows you to sort of pit people against one another, and you're not really a part of it. Uh, so it, it's, it's, the Heartbreaker has some cool, very unique, uh, very unique mechanics to it. Now, the last one is um, Gambler. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the Gambler is the ultimate um, go big or go home character. Because you're going to be, as the name might imply, you're going to be bluffing a lot. You're going to lean into your luck stat. So gamblers excel in luck. Again, getting back to kind of like that that one stat. Mm -hmm. uh, gamblers are all about luck, as you might assume. And it's really about wagering capital. And capital is uh, one of the game's currency. Um, and it's really about waging capital to get what you want. I mean, there there are various other uh, nuances to this to this uh, this gig, but a lot of it is is around you know betting, hoping that things are going to work out, rolling dice more than a lot of the other class uh, to be able to add modifiers to certain situations or rolls. And you know that that like with any dice roll, that's going to either you know really help you or it's going to uh, I can't say that word. Or it's going to really be a detriment. If you're and that's cool. If you're worried about if you're worried about cursing, we do not have any we do not have any sort of restriction on that. Oh, good. So the gambler then can really help you or really fuck you. Mm -hmm. I just I just wanted to make sure we, one of our monsters is the seven dirty words. Just saying. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Now you mentioned you mentioned the you mentioned when it, that when it comes to when it came to the three stats or basically um. Violence, insight, and charm. Which, because of the fact that there's only three, that you don't have. I don't think you're going to have a situation where you have um, what's often known as mad multiple ability dependency. Um, but the two se the two semi um, stats that I did I did want to ask about is um, luck and capital, and how how they particularly work. I've got my assumptions, but I be but. Um, I'm o but I'm open to being wrong on this kind of thing. Yeah. So capital, it's a, it's, it's the currency of the city mm -hmm. and yet it's not really a currency. It's more of kind of an abstract thing. Um, sure. Money, money works in the city, uh, but money and capital are different. And so capital is something that players spend, 
right? Uh, they can spend to do a number of things. And these are things that are available to, to anyone, regardless of their main gig. Now, there are certain gigs, like the gambler, that can use capital in, in exclusive ways. But everyone has the ability to utilize capital earned to be able to modify things, dice rolls, relationships, uh, the outcome of a scenario. Uh, you can even use capital to sort of impress the GM uh, and sway the GM's uh, opinion on something. And so uh, capital is is leverage in many ways. It's also the thing that can uh, get you out of a bad situation. Now that plays into luck a little bit, but luck is more of a, is more of a traditional stat, just like violence, charm, and insight. Uh, it's, it's not as integral as violence, charm, and insight, but luck is very much so one of the core, uh, one of the core stats of the game. It's even you know looking at the the player sheet right now, um, it's one of the four core that are listed, and then it's capital. That's kind of like that wild card fifth stat that I talked about uh, earlier. And so, luck is going to be just that. Um, luck is going to play into various uh, stats and situations that are, are that are going to require a luck roll. Just like you know, uh, a situation that would require uh, a certain level of, of brute force would require violence. Well, there are going to be situations where you're going to be able to pass a luck check as well. And so I would say that luck is kind of like the other three listed, and the capital is your wild card. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I initially saw luck, I had, fig I had figured that this was going to be the extra effort mechanic. Um, if I have to... If I have to use a parallel, since you brought up um, Shadowrun earlier, the um, at the closest the closest thing to an extra effort mechanic would be something like Edge. Um, is luck in is luck in that kind of thing, or is or is that not the case? Yeah, I wouldn't say that's the case. Um, I I would say that luck is more central uh, to to how a character might play. Um, I would actually say that capital is probably a little bit more like that than luck. Though it's hard it's it's hard to quantify exactly uh, when making com when making a clean comparison anyway to another game looking at Picaresque Roman and saying, "Well, this kind of plays like that and this kind of plays like that." You certainly can do that. You can find the similarities, but there's not like a a, a really great through line between Picaresque and a lot of other games because at the end of the day, like you know, Picaresque Roman is a table talk RPG. And you mentioned that in your opening that we're talking about a table talk RPG. We're not talking about a tabletop RPG. And a lot of people who are not familiar with Japanese, you know, RPGs are going to be like, "What the hell is the difference?" Um, but there's quite a quite a big difference, actually. Table talk RPGs typically use simplified D6 systems that tend to be more narrative focus. There, you're not going to be moving around miniatures on a grid based map most of the time. Mm -hmm. Or if there is something where you're sort of like moving around pieces on a board, it's going to be a pretty stripped down version. Um, and Moreover, uh, not only is it going to be accessible and not only is it going to be designed around more theater of the mind types of uh, scenarios, uh, it's also going to be um, designed for one shots. So mm -hmm. you you can string together sessions of picaresque into a larger campaign. In fact, a lot of people do that uh, in the Japanese scene. They'll carry over their characters from game to game, but there's no like leveling up mechanic. There's no progression, so to speak. Uh, you're not going to get a, a certain amount of XP and then, you know, hit level two, and then you're going to get new skills. This isn't going to be a game that is probably it's probably not going to go on for for months or years. I mean, you could figure out a way to make that happen, but this really is designed for one-shot stories in closed narratives. And if you want to link those together between multiple play sessions and if you want to go for months and do that, cool, the game has the flexibility to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really leans into, hey, one off, get in, get out, tell an awesome story with a, a beginning, a middle and an end. Um I will I will admit that as I was going through through the uh, materials, um, there was there was one there was one particular an anime that um, was it that was in the back of my mind when it came to how I'd how I'd structure running something like Picaresque Roman myself personally, um, and this was this is this was a recent um, ser series that went that went through one season. Are you familiar at all with the Great Pretender? Yeah, so only in name. Um, that was that was a co-production between Wit between Wit Studio and Netflix, um, as part of that whole Netflix Japan push. Um, the 
it is it is very much in, it is very much in that whole um heist heist kind of kind of setup with a lot of characters who have varying degrees of trust of each other especially especially since you have a lot of people doing um con jobs in the, in the whole thing and layers of con, of con jobs as as it as it goes um and of course because of the fact that they had that, that they had that kind of name the ending theme that they had to go with was uh, was was the great pretender not even you may as well play into that if you're going to use that for your name um and I'm, yeah you know i'm i'm looking at a i'm looking at a wiki entry for the great pretender right now and i can see definitely where you could draw that comparison what's interesting is when uh when secret son was designing the game yes yakuza and persona definitely played a big influence on it mm-hmm. um but so did uh black lagoon and bacano and actually like if someone was like hey uh compare this game to an anime mm-hmm. uh, I, I would first give my cop-out answer and say that it's a mix of black lagoon and bacano but if they're like no no no, you can't punt you got to choose one i would say bacano i think bacano which i think came out in 2007 anaplex mm-hmm. maybe produce that um that is a very close representation of the the tone, the vibe, the approach to world building uh, that Picaresque takes. And so, that being said, you know, doing like a quick skim of this wiki here for the Great Pretender, this too sounds really cool. This definitely um, a crime comedy uh, could certainly fit the bill for what Picaresque uh, can be. To, you know, depending on the type of game that you want to play, because. You know, we've played this game very much so in a comedic fashion, and and I mean, not, not there's not too much comedy, but we've we've mixed um, drama with comedy, and at the same time, we've played this game very serious. In mm-hmm. fact, there are two actual plays out right now, two English actual plays that approach the game very differently. One is sort of the um, sort of like crime comedy. The other one is a, a bit more serious and gritty, and it's cool to see a game that has a worldview in a system that allows you to kind of do both. Now you could say that's every RPG ever created um, since the formation of the genre, and you would be absolutely correct. And it just feels especially pronounced uh, with picaresque that you can really like read into its material in whatever way that you want to, if you want to see this as like uh, a super gritty crime thriller, or, you know, in the vein of like a Yakuza or a judgment, um, you can do that. Like that's there. If you want to get a little bit more zany with it and get over the top, yeah, grab grab uh, Bacano, grab Persona to a degree. Now you're not going to be dealing with you can go. I, th- I demons, think I can. But... I, I think I can put it like this: you can go serious, like Yakuza, or you can go, or you can go a mix of serious and comedic, like Yakuza. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, like Yakuza Zero. Uh huh. Yeah. I was. Oh. I wasn't even. I wasn't. Well, if we if we want to go if we want to go if we want to go all the way, you can go full comedic like um, Yakuza, like a dragon. <laughs> like yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, like a dragon, absolutely. Oh, I've, I've, I was gonna say Dead Souls, but maybe uh maybe that's not an apt comparison. No one remembers. No, that I, th- I think that I think that's pu- I think that's pushing it a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just it's just um I've often I've often had the meme of, of Yakuza. A, ser- a, ser- a serious story invol- involving res- involving responsibilities to fa- to f- to adoptive family. Also, Yakuza. Kiryu Tan. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally true. That and totally the, f- the fact that several of my friends have have this tradition of always playing um the, always playing the Friday night song every Friday. Nice, <laughs> that's good. I like that. You've got good friends. Yeah. Um. There. There is there is magic to be had in shit posting. I'll put I'll put it that way. Oh, for sure. There needs to be space in the world for shit posting. Yeah. Um but with but um that and to be to be honest when it comes to the whole not re, the whole one shot thing, I um it seem it from what from my experience that seems to be a common thing when it comes to Japanese tabletop. Um, that a lot of them are built more for one shots than um, extended in, extended long term campaigns. It's not to say you can't. It's just um, that's not that's not where that's not where a lot of the leaning is to. Because um, I can definitely say I can definitely say that stuff like du- stuff like um, Double Cross and Tenra were very much leaning towards one shots um, more than extended campaigns. 
For sure. I, I, so I love that about uh, the Japanese approach to RPGs, especially at this point in my life. Like, I got two kids, um, which means if you have two kids, you know that you have no time to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important for me to, you know, the little bit of time that I do get to push up to the table that I get as much out of that few hours as I can possibly get. Like I, I personally don't have time in my life right now for long drawn out game sessions. And I especially don't have time or the ability to commit to a long series of sessions that take place over the course of weeks, months, or even years. I just don't have that. And I don't, uh, and I've never really been that person even when I did have the time. So table talk RPGs speak to me in that way. And that's where I go back to that whole idea. Like, Hey, I liked this game. I hope other people will like this approach to, to RPGs as well. Um, because yeah, there, there are certainly are tons of like one shot encounters that are available for every RPG ever, regardless of country of origin. Mm -hmm. It's just the Japanese really, really like that approach and and i appreciate it right now and I, I i hope other people have as have and will um as well in fact we've had a couple people join the our, our discord to say like hey uh, i back this game because like i love the idea that i can just get in and get out in a single session i'm like yep yeah i and to be fair whenever even before the even before i found out about one shot leaning rpgs um, whenever i would run sessions i would structure my sessions like the like an episode of a tv series and if I was running campaigns, I would structure them like I was doing a episodic or serialized um, season of a television show. I'd even write, I'd even write out episode numbers in my in my uh, GM notes. You're a good GM. I appreciate um, a GM like that. Well, um, the first the first rule that I learned when it came when it came to being a better GM is most of the rules are bullshit. <laughs> no, isn't that the truth? Um, I do. Th I do think a lot. I do think a lot of people should adhere to what's known as Rule Zero. Um, basic. The short ver. There are many variants about what Rule Zero is, but the version that I always stick with is: the game is meant to be fun. If the rules are getting in the way of the fun, the rules get thrown out. That is stated. Ex explicitly in the, in the book a couple times in Picaros Roman's book a couple times uh and, and and I tend to stick more to to the rules as written when it comes to like board games and card games but I think in, in the RPG space I you know I tend to be someone like hey whatever tells the best story that I, for my group anyway like that's that's what we need to be doing then I've... however however your group has fun that's the best way to play the game for you and your group I've ended up doing a bit of both sim simply because well my entire life, I've never played Uno rules as written. <laughs> as anyone, does anyone even know the rules of Uno? Um, I think if you, I think if you play it, on, I think if you play it on a, on a gate on a gaming console, maybe. But um, <laughs> <clears throat> Elder and and the makers of Uno are well aware of this because I remember an edition. I remember in high school, I had an edition of Uno that had a collection of submitted um, house rule variants. Like they put they put out a call for people to mail in uh, for people to for people to mail in write about house rules and they took a selection of them and put them in a house rule edition of Uno. Um, we ended up with some we with some with some board games we ended up house ruling just out of just out of necessity so that there was a timely winner like say the death march known as Monopoly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I you, you you speak to something that I really love. I love when games uh, include variants. Like, hey, these aren't the official rules, but hey, these are some things that you could try. That would be fun. I mean, this goes back to like when I was a kid, like, and I'd build Legos. I remember loving. They'd always include like on the back of the box, like three different ways to build the Lego. Like, you'd only get the rule. You'd only get the like the instruction manual to build the one way. But it's like, hey, look at these other variants you could do if you want to have fun with this. Yeah. And so, you know, even at a young age, I'm like, oh, I love when like official products come with quote unquote official variants like can a game really be uh can you have an official variant i don't know but uh, i love when when games do that uh our first game actually the first game we ever produced uh, the first line wing game has a whole has a whole page dedicated to it in its rule book that is just a bunch of variants to try out i love that stuff um the other the other day the other day i was te i was teaching some of my students how to do how to play um battle con and i Went to I went through some of the variants that it has regarding, say, tag team rules or bo or boss variants of um characters because it's trying to emulate fighting games. 
Um, and of co of course, when I played Magic, and you'll you'll probably you'll probably get a kick out of this. Um, there were there were um, there were two rules that we all, that we had as Ironclad whenever we played. Um, start seven cards start, and land drop. Those aren't bad rules. Those aren't bad rules at all. Um, seven card start is pretty obvious. Uh, land drop is after you do after you st after you do your starting draw. Any lands that you have, you immediately put them down. Yep. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've seen people play that. And it's, it's not. It wasn't the best way to to deal with the mana screwed, mana flooded problem that Magic has. Uh -huh. But it's a start. Yep. For oh. sure. But now I want I want to talk a bit about the uh, about the uh, GM facing end of things when it comes to the city. Um, I get the feel. Would it be correct of me to assume that the city is described fairly loosely so that the GM can kind of fill in the blanks and make his own version of the city? It, that's exactly right. So funny story. Um, at one point, I was talking to Sigrason, and I was like, "Hey, like." would you maybe want to create a map of the city? Like, illustrate a map? We'll commission it, you know, we'll pay for it, whatever. Um, and he basically was like, hey, no, I don't want to do that at all. It's meant to be abstract. And I was like, th you know, this was early on in the mm -hmm. process. And I'm like, okay, no, noted, got it. Because when, when I think of the way, when I think of the way the city is described, what comes to mind is, is things like... Um, Things, things like Tartarus in things like Tart, either Tartarus or or the Midnight Channel or Mementos in the in the Persona games, or um, or dark or the city itself in Dark City, where every every night everything, and everything even the people end up cha end up changing due to how the machines work, um, and because and because of the fact that it's described as both in as a place both in and out of Japan, um. It would it would certainly fit that particular bill, where there are cert there are certain bullet points that that are that can be built upon, but um, each but each um each table's city is meant to be somewhat unique. Yeah, that that's exactly right, and um, it really gives the GM the ability to kind of paint whatever picture they want, which I like. Um, well, I like that it's included as as a GM myself because I I lack creativity. I like when things are spelled out a little bit more for me. But I I really enjoy that Picaresque takes sort of the opposite approach and and takes me out of my comfort zone to say like, hey, here's this thing, and here are kind of like the pillars of the city. But I'm not gonna like build the rest of it for you. You're gonna do that on your own. Like we'll help a little bit here. Like here are some factions. Here we'll talk about this clock tower where the the hands of the clock tower are perpetually stuck at 432. Um, you can decide what that means and why the clock tower is stuck at 432. You know, so I I like that it gives you the skeleton, but it's not gonna flesh it in for you. Mm -hmm. Even though as a GM, I would probably hate that. Um, but I did not GM uh, Picaresque. I wanted to experience it mostly as a player. Although, you know, I'm doing a lot of a lot of the, the book proofing, um, just like the final proof stuff. And I've been very hands-on with this project, probably more than all of our other projects, just because RPGs are, are indeed my favorite genre. Um, so it's although I'm like, oh, you know, if I was GMing this, this would be tough for me. I, I definitely like that it takes that that approach, and I think players will probably like that too. You get to kind of claim ownership over your city. Yeah, and truth be truth be told, um, what I'm kind of reminded of with that with that setup is, are you familiar at all with Thirteenth Age? No. Um. That was a that was a project that was published by Pelgrane a few a few years ago that was developed by um by tweet by tweet and Heinzo and is kind is kind of a high is kind of a hybrid of elements between um D and D third and fourth edition and one of the key things that it does instead of doing the alignment thing which I have problems with personally is a series of icons and your and a player. And the icons are not given specific names; they're given essentially titles, stuff like the Orc Lord, the Lich King, the Elf Queen, all, all, all that kind of stuff. 
And while there are certain motifs that they follow, there's room to fill in the blanks with each of them. And a pli and a PC is going to have a um, positive, negative, or a conflicted relationship. And it doesn't say what that po what that um, relationship is. That's up for that's up to the um, player. So you could have two people who have a relationship with the same icon, even the same um, polarity, but they might but they might be interpreted different ways. Yeah, this is cool. I'm actually uh, I pulled it up uh, as you were talking about it and uh, went to the relationships bit right when you said it. This is interesting. So is the uh, the one unique thing. That's really neat. I like that. Yeah, some something that I'm glad that they did is in the actual book is um is give a, is give a few examples about what would be a good, bad, and absolutely not idea when it comes to the one unique thing, which is. Something something that I get on other um, other narrativist games for not doing is giving examples about what would be a good or bad um, nar um, narrative seed. It's one of the problems I have with honestly, it's one of the problems I have with Fate is that it does is that it doesn't go into detail about it, about giving advice for aspects. But um, with it now with that and with that with all that in mind, um, since you mentioned the whole spelling out, are there a, are there a few and it don't and you can tell me if this is spoilers, but are there a few sample cities or sample um, sections that that can provide a template to fall to follow with? Yeah. So one of the stretch goals that we unlocked was adding was actually adding additional information about the city itself. Mm -hmm. So that information will kind of uh, spell out a little bit. It's it's not going to be a lot because, again, that's not like the essence of this game. But it's going to spell out more than it would had we not unlocked that goal to include that content mm -hmm. um, into the game where you're going to, okay, you're going to, it's, you're going to see more about the city and you're going to say, okay, so that's kind of how some of these things work because there are, there are bits of the city that were intentionally not fleshed out and it's kind of like, oh, uh, It'd be cool, like if you gave me a little bit more about this thing over here, because that would actually help me probably set up a game a little bit better, be able to tell this kind of story a little bit better. Um, something that might just be taken for granted in, in other Western RPGs, uh, but is definitely not being taken for granted or utilized at all here um, in Picaresque Roman. And so, being able to add those additional pages to the city will, I think, uh, tackle kind of what you're talking about there. There won't be samples. We're not going to give you a sample of of what you know, a city or a couple cities could look like, but we will kind of peel layers of the onion back on the city as it was thought up of by Sigreson in his image of the city, and that will be in the book now. Um, and I think that'll help GMs especially, but it'll help players too, just uh, spell out a little, a little bit. Now, the cool thing about, uh, about Picaresque Roman as well is, and this is the case with with every uh, Japanese RPG, and that is uh, it comes with a replay in the back of the book. Mm. So it's one of those things where you're like, um, a replay for those who are unfamiliar uh, is just an, is a transcription of an actual play session that was uh, done either by the design team or like a group of play testers or some other group that agreed to allowing their session to be recorded, transcribed, and put into the book. Mm. And uh, there's one of those for, for Picaresque Roman as well. And it not only... I think gives you an opportunity to say like, oh, okay, that's how that mechanic works in in actual play, or gives the the opportunity to say, oh, okay, that's how that skill works, or it gives the GM an opportunity to say, oh, so that's how you can approach this scenario. Um, it also just sort of fills in some of the gaps that are naturally missing in a rule book, things that you just naturally would not put into the copy of a rule book, you get a chance to uh, sort of illuminate in a replay. And that is a, that's an, a pretty exclusively Japanese thing to do. Um, and it's, it's present and accounted for in picaresque Roman. And so I think between uh, the, the additional pages that we added on the city, which actually came from the settings book that was published in Japan uh, and then, you know, giving folks the replay in the back of the book as well, it'll clear up some of the, the generalities or the vague nature of the game and allow for uh, GMs and players to tell the stories they want to tell. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Yeah, so uh, PDFs uh, should be done next month. And so folks will get their stuff. It'll be the end of next month. If all goes accordingly, you know, you, you never know how 
these things are going to go. But uh, we are projected to deliver all the PDF content by the end of next month. And then the books are scheduled for January of next year. It's a pretty quick turnaround because uh, more so than all of our other projects, this came to Kickstarter uh, basically finished already. Um, uh, and then we we created some scenarios specifically for the Kickstarter. So we're actually still finishing up two of the five scenarios. Three of the scenarios were already written before we went to the Kickstarter just because you know, I had planned out what I thought we were projected to to earn uh, mm -hmm. in the Kickstarter. So we took care of three of the stretch goal scenarios already before the Kickstarter went live. We're finishing up the the other two that we unlocked. And so it's going to be a quick turnaround, October and January. Mm -hmm. And with... Now, with with all that in mind, since you mentioned um, projections, I do want to congratulate you for managing to get managing to get past your um, initial funding goal five times over. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and with all, with all that in mind, I'd like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And I appreciate you having me on. And it's been fun. Anytime you see fit to return, whether whether it's to further delve into picaresque or fu or future projects or just to just to just to la just to um check every cone in case in in case in case a certain in case a certain crazy guy is is under there, um <laughs> the door is always open. And I appreciate it, yeah, and I I hope uh, I I do hope we can do this again. Um, if if it's not to talk about picaresque Roman, maybe it's just to you know shoot the breeze on various other RPGs, especially mm -hmm. of the Japanese variety. Mm -hmm. And you know we have at least one, uh, one more Japanese RPG mm -hmm. in the queue, at least. Mm -hmm. So um, you know maybe we'll maybe we'll have this conversation again in, in a couple months. Yep. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I love drinking. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody, and don't ask me for shit!